Hi guys, welcome to the last uh, video lecture for unit four. We are flying through our units. We're right on pace, doing a great job. Uh, a few things I wanna start with is this week looks a little bit different than the last few weeks because you do not have school on Wednesday. Uh, so your schedule is as follows. Monday, you should be watching the lecture video. Tuesday, uh, you should be doing the unit reading, starting to work on journal number nine, and uh, also working on the Monroe Doctrine reading. Uh, Wednesday, you do not have any school. Thursday, uh, you will have some time to work on your short paper. That short paper is due Friday at 11.59, and then on Friday, you have your unit exam. Your unit exam is due by 11.59 on Friday. Uh, that'll be posted the same way your exams have been posted in the past. There's a form already posted on Teams. Uh, you'll have it open for the whole day, and know that that'll close Friday night. Uh, make sure that you have your three assignments submitted by Friday. That would be your Journal 9, your evaluation of the Monroe Doctrine, and your short paper. Your readings for the week are listed in your Journal 9 assignment, so you can find out which readings uh, you need to do to include in your journal there. Uh, any questions about the assignment for this week, please let me know. Also know that you guys are starting in-person classes for your college classes this week. Please be sure to be checking Teams, your email for messages from your teachers regarding what periods, what classrooms you're going to be in. All right, without further ado, we have two sections to go through today. Uh, this first section that we're going to talk about is the era of good feelings. We're going to talk a little about the industrial growth of the United States during this time period and what we're looking at for foreign policy. So what the heck do I mean by era of good feelings? Well, we are going to see the Federalist Party die with the War of 1812. Uh, the Federalist Party really takes a nosedive at the Hartford Convention where uh, notable figures from the Federalist Party had met to discuss uh, not supporting the War of 1812, which does not make them look good because we are supposed to be united against the British uh, and through that convention you see the popular support of that party uh, fade so the, pop the Federalist Party will be out. The Democratic Republicans are going to take power of Congress and the presidency so both houses in Congress and the presidency uh, starting in 1816. James Monroe is going to be another two-term president and they're going to hold the majority in Congress by 85%. That is crazy power for this, uh, this party. Uh, we're going to see the American system be adopted during this, during this time. We'll talk a little bit more about the American system in just one second. But to get a brief idea of this, we're building off of Madison's ideas that include support for the National Bank, protective tariffs, which is supporting industry, and federal funding for internal improvements, which we'll get to in a second. But you're going to see this American system uh, come about during the era of good feelings where we have strong nationalism spreading throughout the United States and the American system is going to push that nationalism under this one party dominant system uh, all at the same time. People really wanting to come together as the United States under one party, one political set of ideas. Uh, this shift for the uh, um, the uh, the party system here, we're going to see a shift from the first party system to the second party system. The first party system was the uh, Federalist versus the Democratic Republicans. That's our first political party system. The second party system is, in the beginning, it's just going to be the Democratic Republicans, but eventually the political party of the Whigs is going to come about uh, in, in opposition to the Democrats, the Whigs 
will be led by Henry Clay. We'll hear more about him uh, during this section as well. Uh, Martin Van Buren is going to be a leading member of the Democratic Party. Uh, we'll see the, the new Democratic Party kind of breaking away from the traditional Democratic-Republican Party platform. Um, in 1821 in New York, we're going to see the Democratic Party go to a national scale. Uh, and this, this new Democratic Party is going to shift, and you see this with the American system, where we, we see the need for a strong federal role uh, in situations such as infrastructure, uh, such as the National Bank. We're going to see the chartering of the second National Bank in 1816, which is really just allowing the National Bank to continue, which is another demonstration of federal power, uh, the federal role in the economy. Um, we're going to see a shift in the Democratic Republicans to supporting industry. That's going to be huge. So this new Democratic Party is uh, kind of pivoting away from the ideas of the Democratic Republicans as originated by Jefferson. Uh, and, and this is a little bit different in the second party system. Under this second party system, we're going to see uh, a, a democratization of American life through embracing public opinion. Uh, so we're going to start to see the government kind of embrace the ideas of the public, increase voter participation. We're going to see that during this lecture. Uh, and we're going to see the uh, newspaper start to drive different political party platforms because people are reading the paper more. And uh, the uh, publication of the party platforms in the newspapers is going to uh, lend a hand in growing the newspapers even more. And we're going to see people starting to get involved, to be a little bit more educated on the political process. So during this system, this time of the era of good feelings, we're going to see a lot of changes uh, under the, this system of one-party dominance from 1817 to 1825. The economic policies are going to illustrate a shift in the Democratic Republicans to the more just Democratic uh, Party. Uh, and it begins with the tariff of 1816. This is a this is a shift in the Democratic Republican Party to the to more of a Federalist point of view on economic policies, where we see the tariff uh, being put in place by the federal government and it being used to promote the growth of industry. The way that we use a tariff, which is a tax on imported goods, to promote the growth of industry is by increasing the price of foreign-made goods and kind of channeling people into buying American-made products. And when the federal government takes the stance of putting in place a tariff that they know will support industry and kind of discourage agriculture, uh, because uh, agricultural products being traded, uh, needing to import the uh, machinery that they need from other countries, that hurts agriculture. This tax on imported goods hurts agriculture, but it helps industry. And when we see the federal government taking a stance by putting in place a tariff, you're going to start to see this split among people because the, the, the farmers are going to kind of resent the federal government for helping industry but not helping them. Uh, the American system, as I mentioned on the last slide, the American system is going to be designed by Henry Clay and one of the main pieces of the American system is internal improvements. Now by internal improvements we're talking canals, roads, turnpikes, and eventually railroads. And the goal of all these internal improvements were to connect uh, all of the nation. We have now expanded. We saw Jefferson purchase the Louisiana Territory, which doubled the size of the United States. Now we have to figure out how to connect that Western Territory with the Eastern side of the United States to ensure that we don't lose that Western Territory to any foreign adversaries or that they don't decide to break off into their own country. We need to keep the United States united. Uh, and internal improvements, this, this network of transportation, would theoretically do that. 
So we're going to see canals uh, being built, those man-made waterways, as you can see pictured there. The, the most notable being the Erie Canal, which connects Lake Erie to the Hudson River, the Great Lakes to the Atlantic Ocean via the Hudson River. There's going to be 360-some miles of, uh, of a network here be, beginning to be built in 1817. The goal here was to connect the eastern seaboard with the old northwest, uh, connecting uh, farmers to the industry centers, uh, allowing for trade of goods to be moved easier and more efficiently. Now, roads and turnpikes, what we're talking about here, these, these are going to be a little bit different than the roads that you know today. Uh, these roads and turnpikes, which are kind of very similar to the highway system, are going to be dirt. They aren't going to be paved like we use today, but turnpikes are going to utilize the same idea of the tolling system, which is something that if you guys are driving and you're driving to different areas, maybe you've used that before. Um, the money that's collected on these tolls was kind of ingeniously used to make improvements to the roads. So eventually, so essentially they're trying to make the roads pay for themselves. Uh, and we're going to see increased transportation to different parts of the United States achieving that goal of creating this network of transportation to connect the whole nation and really uh, keep us united. Now, through the American system, the South is going to start to harbor some resentment uh, for the federal government because they see the federal government helping industry but not doing anything to help the, uh, the agriculture within the United States, which the original Democratic Republican Party had said was the backbone for the nation. And now they're kind of abandoning that idea. Uh, under the American system and the new economic policy, support from the state governments was crucial. Uh, these new improvements that we're going to see being made were very expensive. Uh, some state politicians are going to support uh, using uh, the government uh, to push forward here and support using funds to build these new improvements because they saw the bigger picture that these internal improvements would stimulate the economy. So with the support of the state governments, you're going to see the American system have some success. Uh, we are going to see the American Industrial Revolution come about from the late 1790s and follow through through the 1830s. Uh, the U.S. is going to be behind Great Britain. Now, I know you guys learned about the Industrial Revolution of Great Britain last year in Global or a couple years ago for my seniors. Um, and that's going to happen in the 18th century, so the 1700s. But that's going to happen much earlier than the United States. So now we kind of have to play catch up. Uh, and a lot of the ideas that we see in the American Industrial Revolution are going to actually uh, have originated in the, the British Industrial Revolution and be carried over to the United States. Uh, first example of that is Samuel Slater, who's going to open the first industrial mill in the United States in 1790. Uh, he's going to build this mill with a design borrowed from the British model. Now, a textile mill uh, such as this would increase the speed at which cotton could be spun into yarn. So here we're kind of seeing twofold. Um, we are using cotton more, and we're going to get to the cotton industry here in a second, but we are producing um, textiles from cotton that we had not done before. So now the United States is starting to become a little bit more independent with industry growing, uh, and the textile industry is just one example of that. The factory system is going to be utilized in the United States for this industrial revolution, which increases the productivity. The factory system is going to increase product 
productivity. We have this network system of small parts that are a piece of a larger production process and these small parts are used to carry out a number of individual uh, tasks that all end in this large piece of the end product and that quickens the process. Some of the industries that this is going to be used in is like shoe and boot making um, and, and it turns into this fast factory system which is central to the production process. We see an increase in production with the factory system because the jobs can be done quicker and we're seeing employment increase. Jobs are being created. This is all good for the United States. Um, we are going to see females start to take on a role in the Industrial Revolution as well. And this is going to begin uh, first with the Boston Association. They are going to recruit thousands of New England farm girls to work in factories. These factories become known as the Lowell Mills. They're going to be located in Lowell, Massachusetts. And the, the uh, Lowell factories, the, these textile mills, are going to employ female factory workers and, and they're really going to benefit, not the female factory workers, but the, the mills are going to benefit because these women work for less pay than men. And, and they uh, are going to live at these Lowell mills, uh, taking the less pay, sending it back to their families. They were often young, um, young single women. And this gives women a new role outside the male-dominated home. So we're seeing social, the society of the United States changing a little bit in this industrial revolution. We're also going to see the rise of wage labor. This is going to lead to the exploit of workers, which will follow through into the uh, mid-1800s, where we see strikes start rising against conditions, pays, hour, hourly uh wages and things like that uh, but know that the the wage labor the idea of wage laborers originates with the beginning of the industrial revolution this unskilled labor class is going to start to develop and uh, really be subjected to some pretty harsh conditions uh, during this time we're going to see the system of credit uh, expand which allowed for entrepreneurs to make money from new business ventures during the industrial revolution we are going to encourage entrepreneurs to go out with their new ideas um, and with these new inventions these new ideas uh, the increase in productivity we are going to need to improve the transportation for raw materials and the need to improve transportation to move these manufacturers goods so state governments are going to begin to encourage uh, banking and increase their transportation networks so in order to be an entrepreneur and to start a business you need to be able to have access to a loan which is why the state governments are encouraging banking uh, the market revolution at this time uh, is going to be very important because we will see uh, more efficient ways for transportation, uh, more efficient means to produce uh, manufactured goods from the raw materials, and uh, the, the uh, new finished products. Really, the reason that the Industrial Revolution takes off at such a rate that it does in the United States is because of our access to raw materials. And if you think back to the origination of the colonies, that's what drew the British into colonizing the United States in the first place. So it's no surprise that that same idea is going to kind of uh, rocket ship us into the uh, Industrial Revolution. So what the heck is the role of the national bank in this process? Well, I just told you that in order for new business ventures to be successful, entrepreneurs had to have access to uh, uh, the banks, uh, loans, and things like that. Uh, Madison at this time is going to think that he can get rid of the national bank in 1811. And this would then leave the states to need to create their own banks 
to set their own regulation of loans and figure out who to lend money to with very little guidance from the federal government. This little regulation of the state banks is going to lead to an economic collapse in 1819 followed by six years of a depression. Uh, there is a pattern created in this capitalist economy of expansion uh, and then regular periods of a sharp downturn in the economy because there is no federal institution to guide the banks and who to lend money to, what interest rates should be set, uh, and, and that is going to lead us into a downturn in the economy when banks can just say, everybody can have a loan. Uh, it doesn't matter if you can pay it back. Uh, so the without the national bank, you're going to see the economy begin to suffer because there was very little regulation from the federal government. Uh, because of the Industrial Revolution in the United States, we're going to see lifestyles start changing. First and foremost, we have Eli Whitney with the cotton gin. Uh, we, with the cotton gin, we see a shift in the cash crop in the South from tobacco to cotton. Gin is short for, short for engine. And what the cotton gin did was separate cotton from seeds, which used to be a grueling, grueling, grueling process. It's, it's very difficult to pick the cotton, the cotton seeds out of the cotton and separate that so that the cotton can be used uh, to create textiles. But the cotton gin actually makes that process more efficient by 50 times uh, the, the pace of what could have been done in a day by hand. The cotton gin is going to revolutionize production in the South, and it's also going to create a dependency of the South, not only on cotton, but on slavery, because now we need more people in the fields picking the cotton. We need people working the cotton gins to keep up with production uh, for these textile mills throughout the United States. So now we're seeing hand in hand uh, slavery and agriculture being uh, intricately tied uh, to our economy and to the success of the nation as well. So we're going to see this rise of King Cotton in the South. There, there is going to be an increased need for slaves, but uh, the importation of slavery uh, was made illegal in 1808. So now we're going to see a shift to the internal slave trade within the United States because it is illegal to import slaves. And the internal slave trade network is going to be uh, channeling African Americans into the cotton belt. In 1820, the North is going to outlaw slavery, but the South is going to see a need for it more than ever. All at the same time that this Industrial Revolution is taking off, we're going to see the Second Great Awakening come about. And if you remember the First Great Awakening at all, that was the opening of our eyes to religion, kind of turning back to religion. And we're going to see this again. Uh, the Second Great Awakening is going to be known for their camp meetings, more outdoors. Uh, large numbers of people are going to gather at these meetings and be converted in a more enthusiastic style of preaching and audience participation. Evangelicals are going to be at the heart of this because they favored the ordinary people over the elites. They're going to favor the idea of free will and the ability to change your situation, uh, kind of rise through the ranks of society. This is going to be more of a Protestant idea. Uh, and very important to the Second Great Awakening, you're going to see uh, the participation of white women and African Americans increase. Uh, because of that idea that anybody can have a connection with God, that same basis that pushed us towards the Declaration of Independence is going to carry through to the Second Great Awakening. Uh, Robert Fulton is going to give us the steamboat. The steamboat is going to be revolutionary because now we can travel up against the stream uh, through rivers, which allows for uh, better transportation, faster transportation. 
uh, railroads are going to be developed in Great Britain by a guy named George Stephenson. Uh, this, they are going to use steam technology. That idea from Great Britain is going to move into the United States. Baltimore and the Ohio Railroad are going to be the first. Uh, they, they are going to come about in 1828 and become more competitive uh, with the railroad or with the canal network in the United States. In 1830, the South Carolina Canal and uh, the Railroad Company are going to form. Uh, the Transcontinental Railroad is going to attempt to connect the Central Pacific and the Union Pacific Railroads. Uh, this, with the building of the Transcontinental Railroad, we're going to see uh, a dependency on immigrant workers. The Transcontinental Railroad is going to be built by Irish and Chinese workers. The railroad is going to revolutionize the United States and the connection of all the different uh, pieces that the United States has gathered uh, in territory and expansion over time. Other pieces of technology that we need to note, Cyrus McCormick with the horse-drawn reaper, John Deere with the steel plow, both of those inventions uh, it, allowing agricultural work to become a little bit easier. Uh, Samuel Morse with the Morse code and the telegraph, increasing communication within the United States. And I would argue the most important invention we see is Eli Whitney with interchangeable parts. The idea of interchangeable parts, parts that can be used in the manufacturing process of many different uh, goods, products, is monumental in increasing production. And the whole goal of uh, producing a good is to increase uh, how much you can produce and how fast you can do it in order to make more money. Because at the end of the day, that is exactly what we want to do. Let's look at relations within the United States. Industry in the North, factory in the North is going to take off. And with the uh, kind of eruption of industry, we are going to see the increase in immigrant workers or immigrants coming to the United States to work. Uh, between 1820 and 1870, seven and a half million immigrants are going to come to the United States. And they're going to come from North Northern and Western Europe. Uh, some causes of this, and we'll talk more about this in the next units to follow, but just a brief preview. Some causes of this increased immigration. You've got the Irish potato famine being a push factor. Germans trying to escape political unrest at the time. So as factories take off in the north, there is going to be a draw of immigrants to come to find uh, work and to chase that American dream. Uh, agriculture in the South is going to take off much in part due to those inventions that we uh, mentioned on the uh, slide before. Uh, because of the increase in agriculture, you're going to see that increase in dependency on slavery, as I had mentioned, which begins to divide the nation. Uh, and that's going to create problems for us moving into the next unit, that stark divide between industry in the north and agriculture in the south. And uh, that's going to push us to divide on the idea of slavery. Um, and that will push us more towards the Civil War. Uh, relations Within also has to pay some mind to the changing role of women at the time. Women are beginning to push out of that Republican motherhood role where we're just meant to raise children that will lead the nation, uh, whether that be sons who go on to participate in the in the democracy or whether that be uh, other, be other daughters that will then raise more sons. Uh, we're seeing women step outside the home. The factories are going to call for more workers and some of those workers are going to be women. So a changing role of women at the time as well. So now we have to turn to look at relations abroad. Uh, 
something that's going to push the United States to consider what is happening outside of our borders is the uh, alignment of the different European powers into the quintuple alliance. Uh, when we see these European powers coming together and aligning, the United States must look outside our borders. While Washington is going to encourage us to keep neutrality forever, no entangling alliances, that will be in the back of our brain, but we also need to self-preserve. And we, we now have to consider we've gone through the Revolutionary War. We had to face off with England yet again in the War of 1812, and we want to make sure that doesn't happen. So when we see Europe kind of rallying the troops, uh, we... we perk our ears up a little bit. Uh, as Europe is aligning, uh, the Spanish Empire is on the decline. Uh, they had lost many of their colonies, uh, and th those colonies had become to be independent, those colonies being located in South America. Uh, many of those newly independent colonies are adopting a republic, which is something that the United States wants to support because that's what we did, and any other successes with that would be wonderful. Uh, so when we see the European powers stating that Europe wants to attempt to colonize in North and South America in those newly independent colonies, we deem those acts of aggression. Um, and those are going to be addressed by Monroe in his State of the Union, only given to Congress in 1823. Uh, and that's going to push us to uh, form what is known as the Monroe Doctrine. At the time that the doctrine is issued, uh, all Spanish and Portuguese colonies in Latin America, except for Cuba and Puerto Rico, had gained independence. And the United States is going to want to guarantee that no other European power is going to move in and take away their independence. Uh, the British Empire is surprisingly on the same page with us. Uh, and... Uh, the British also want to keep the European powers out of the New World for fear that uh, their trade would be in jeopardy. Uh, so we both have the, the same kind of stake here. The United States doesn't want a strong neighbor to their south and to their west, and the British don't want to sacrifice any of their trade. Uh, so since the United States doesn't really have much of a navy, the British Royal Navy was mostly who was enforcing the Monroe Doctrine. Uh, and, and this is mainly in part uh, of their efforts to secure neutrality of the seas. Uh, the Monroe Doctrine is going to be developed by Secretary of State John Quincy Adams, son of John Adams, and its main goal is to end colonization in North and South America. And the way that we agree to this is that uh, the United States will say we will never try to take Cuba or uh, Texas. They will remain independent. Now, we know the end to that story that the United States is going to get Texas, but at the time, we did not have our sights set on Texas. So we agree uh, not to do that, and we also agree to stay out of European affairs. Uh, we won't bother anybody, which means we won't be fighting with anyone. We'll trade with everyone, fight with no one. And the British are pretty down for this idea. And they say, okay, as long as you agree to do that, uh, we will help you keep uh, these newly independent colonies independent. So the Monroe Doctrine essentially, just like the picture shows there, draws a line through uh, the, the Atlantic and says, nope, Europe, do not come over here, stop right where you are, and uh, North and South America are off limits to you, which is good for us because we remain neutral, uh, we even get the British to kind of help us out a little bit, and we get to live another day. The very last section that we have is going to be dedicated all to the age of Jackson, uh, which uh, he is one of the worst presidents as far as treatment of the people, but one of the most interesting presidents as far as what actions he takes and how he kind of revolutionizes the office of the president. 
We have to start with the election of 1824. Uh, this is going to be an election full of Democratic Republicans. We, we are going to have uh, President Monroe being replaced with William Crawford, the Secretary of State. Crawford is going to run against Andrew Jackson and John Quincy Adams. Uh, Henry Clay is even going to throw his name in the hat. All four of those uh, who are running are all going to be Democratic Republicans, although Jackson is going to call himself a Democrat, giving a new name to the party. Um, they 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 uh, leave this open so that on the ticket the people can vote between all of these candidates who essentially are running uh, for the same party. The way the votes break down is Jackson is going to get 43% of the popular vote, but he is going to tie, and the, the race is going to be incredibly close uh, between Jackson and John Quincy Adams, the son of the second president. Uh, Crawford uh, gets a significantly less amount of votes in the Electoral College, and Henry Clay is going to finish fourth and pretty much not even need to be talked about. Um, the House is going to have to choose the president for a second time. They have to choose the sixth president because no official majority was awarded in the Electoral College. Uh, Henry Clay is going to look at uh, who is running, him being in fourth place, holds some sway to who is going to vote uh, for which candidate. Uh, and Henry Clay hates Andrew Jackson. They had served in the War of 1812 together. He doesn't like the way Jackson runs things. He doesn't like his attitude. And Henry Clay decides to uh, try to cut a deal with John Quincy Adams. Because really, Adams and Jackson were the forerunners here. Uh, Henry Clay is going to give the presidency to Adams, pushing the House to choose him in return for the Secretary of State position. Now, the reason that Clay wanted the Secretary of State position was because it was said to be the stepping stone to the presidency. Uh, if you got to be Secretary of State, then maybe you would go on to be the president. Now, Jackson is no dummy. He knows about this idea. He knows about this deal. He labels it the corrupt bargain. This angers the Jacksonians who had voted for Jackson, who knew that he had a large percentage of the popular vote. And the corrupt bargain is going to give Jackson uh, the, the clout to kind of demean Adams during his entire presidency. Adams had favored a strong federal government in the economy. Jackson denounces him as elitist. He's going to challenge every decision made by, Jack, by Adams. And Jackson is going to present himself as a champion of the common man and paint Adams as a kingly elitist who is not in touch with the people. During Adams' presidency, uh, Jackson is going to uh, push for this idea of majority rule. Now, Adams is going to be uh, a different kind of president. He's going to favor uh, a bold economic role for the national government. Uh, he, he is going to push for the federal government's role in the, economic, or in the American system because remember, him and Henry Clay, besties, Henry Clay had come up with the American system. Uh, but few of Adams' ideas are going to be put into action, um, and he hurts his own case by publicly expressing concerns about the potential dangers of democracy, the dangers of the participation of the people. And when politicians in Congress refuse to act uh, dis decisively to pass uh, rules and regulations uh, for fear of displeasing the voters, Adams is going to say that uh, he's going to uh, kind of poke fun at them and say that they seem to proclaim that the world that we are 
pleased by uh, the will of our constituents. So he's saying we shouldn't be controlled by the people. Why? We should do what we need to do for our political party, which is the exact opposite of what uh, Jackson is going to pledge. Uh, Adams is not going to do himself any favors because he refuses to campaign because he did not believe in a popularity contest. Uh, so it's, Adams kind of shoots himself in the foot. His actions as president really do push him into that role of the elitist that's out of touch with the people, just like Jackson wanted him to do. Uh, in 1825, we're going to see uh, the overturning of a treaty that had taken land from the Native Americans, stating that this issue was one for the federal government. Uh, this is going to be disliked by the governor of Georgia and the people because it essentially gives land back to the Native Americans uh, when really the people in the South, especially in Georgia, want to take the land from the Native Americans. So that loses favor for Adams again. Uh, Jackson is going to warn the nation that they had been corrupted by what's called special privilege uh, and characterized especially by the policies of the Second National Bank. He's going to say that the federal government has taken on too large of a role and we need to get back to majority rule, the people's voice, get away from these career politicians. Sound familiar? Uh, it, there is going to be, uh, in the origination of the country, in the Constitution, a land requirement for all voters. That land requirement is going to be taken away. And what this does is push for more public participation in the vote. So you're going to see an expansion of democracy uh, as this push from Jackson. And we call this Jacksonian democracy the taking away of the land requirement to vote and the increase in voter participation. We refer to that as Jacksonian democracy. In the election of 1828, you're going to see Andrew Jackson, who calls himself a Democrat, face off against John Quincy Adams, the Democratic Republican. Uh, John Quincy Adams is going to be out of favor with the people. Jackson is going to uh, really emulate the story of the nation. He, he, he has this uh, western frontier story of how he grew up and pulled himself up by the bootstraps and he served in the War of 1812. He defeated the Native Americans. He's a military hero. He's championed the common man's voice through Jacksonian democracy. They call him Old Hickory because of his, uh, his work in the western frontier. He, he knew how to farm. He knew uh, he was very educated and he had become a lawyer. All of this painted him in the best favor with the most people, which wins him the election over John Quincy Adams, who had been painted as an aristocrat. Uh, we are going to see mudslinging take place in this election, and really for the first time between two candidates. Uh, and what mudslinging is, is each party waged a dirty campaign. Now, it got so dirty that Jackson's wife, Rachel, had been painted as an adulteress. Uh, during the campaign, many stories were put out there um, about adultery with her participation. And very shortly after Jackson wins, after the campaign, his wife Rachel passes away. Now, Jackson is never going to let this go. And he's going to blame his political enemies for her death, saying that it was the stress of the campaign. Look at what you did to her. She died because of how you ran. But realistically, Jackson participated just as badly in this mudslinging as uh, the Democratic-Republican camp under Adams did. 
At Jackson's inauguration, we are going to see an inauguration like no other. Uh, there is going to be a mob of what was called uneducated ruffians uh, that gather for Jackson's inauguration, illustrating Jackson's connection to the people, seeing his popularity among this new voting class that no longer had to have a land requirement and opened up to a lower social class and they didn't have to be elite, educated, wealthy, white men anymore. It could be all white men. This uh, turning out at Jackson's inauguration gets him to be known as the king of the mob, the voice of a new set of people. Under Jackson, we're going to see a new party structure. Uh, Jackson, his cabinet is going to be one for the ages. It becomes a cabinet of unofficial uh, advisors. Uh, they're gonna, his cabinet's gonna consist of a group of friends that he handpicks to, uh, to uh, fill these positions as rewards for their involvement in his campaign. His Secretary of State is going to be Martin Van Buren, uh, who was a politician from New York that had helped him uh, throughout the campaign. What we call this awarding of officials, uh, these government positions, is the spoils system. Think about what it means to be spoiled. You don't deserve something. You didn't work hard for it. You just get it because you wanted it. That's exactly what this is. Jackson uh, is going to uh, put people in these positions that uh, did that were not qualified, that did not earn them. The only thing they did was get him elected. And the reason he does this is Jackson thought that too many career politicians existed and that these people had lost touch with reality. He said we needed to clear out the old offices, <coughs> drain the swamp, and replace them with appointees of the winning candidate. Uh, what it, his goal here was to take away from corruption, but what it ends up doing is leading to way more corruption because he was putting people in these offices uh, that were not qualified, uh, and that leads to problems in and of itself. The Founding Fathers had feared a tyrannical president, but thought that a strong Congress could offset that possibility. Now, Jackson is going to take a completely different approach to this and often argue with Congress, not agreeing with what laws they wanted to pass or what actions they wanted to take. Jackson is going to feel that Congress was not representative of the people, and he thought that the president was the only one that could be trusted to stand up for what the people really wanted, which meant that he had to take a stand against Congress. The way that Jackson is going to take a stand against Congress is through the use of the veto. He is going to use the veto the most that any president had ever done at that time, and he does that uh, 12 times. He utilizes the pocket veto, which is really just ignoring propositions by Congress until they expire. This is going to be the first time a president ever uses that. Um, and he, he does this in retaliation to the formation of the second party in this, this second party system. The new party that's going to develop under Jackson is going to be known as the Whig Party. They're going to be guided by their leader, Henry Clay, who still harbors this resentment for Jackson. And they're going to call themselves the Whigs, uh, the name of the English anti-monarchist party. And the this is what they form in retaliation to uh, what, uh, what Jackson had become known as which was King Andrew because he really took the position of the presidency and and turned it into a tyrannical position through his use of the veto uh, and that's what that picture which you're gonna see again very soon hint hint wink wink maybe on your uh, test is going to indicate so you can see it says born to command King Andrew the first of veto uh, 
memory uh, had I been consulted. So he's really going to take on this position of he, his word is the only word and nothing can go past him unless he deems it to be able to. So he really changes the structure of the presidency in that way. Now Jackson as president, oh boy, oh boy, we've only got a little bit left and I promise I'll try to make this quick, but Jackson as president, we could go on uh, for days about this, um, but we're going to see a tariff pass to protect industry in northern manufacturing which is going to infuriate the south now the tariff is going to be passed in 1828 remember jackson gets elected in 1828 this tariff is going to be a part of john quincy adams presidency uh and and the south is going to be infuriated by this tariff to the point that they call it the tariff of abominations because this tariff uh, had uh, set, set it up so that uh, the northern industry would benefit the most while the southern agriculture would be hurt. Uh, in what we're going to see is Calhoun uh, from South Carolina label this the tariff of abomination. The extremists are going to think that this would be enough to dissolve the Union. Calhoun is going to propose the idea of nullification. Uh, earlier, Calhoun had supported the tariff of 1816, but he really wanted a political future. So he says, uh, we are going to try to pull us into this middle ground uh, and, and get rid of or bring down uh, this tariff. The federal government existed by the will of the states. Calhoun says that the states could declare this law void because the federal government can only live another day with the participation with the working with state governments. Uh, so what happens is the tariff of 1832 lowers the tariff, but apparently that was not enough for the South. So South Carolina is going to pass the South Carolina Ordinance of Nullification in 1832, which meant that as far as the South was concerned, no tariff existed at all and they were not going to pay for it. Now, Jackson's going to be president in 1832 when this South Carolina Ordinance of Nullification happens, and he does not support nullification at all. Jackson is going to instead respond with asking for federal troops to enforce federal laws, which is going to lead to an armed conflict uh, if, if, uh, if we don't uh, kind of bring down the tensions. The only reason the armed conflict is avoided is because of Congress, who was led by Clay uh, to revise the tariff with a compromise bill. So this tariff of abominations being met with the, ter the lowering of the tariff in 1832, the South still not being happy, trying to nullify state law again to ignore uh, the, the federal government's request for this tariff, uh, really starts to bring up this idea of states rights who has the power do the states have the power does the federal government have the power and this issue is going to carry us right straight to the civil war now the national bank is going to be a whole other issue some are going to argue that the concentrated power of the bank is going unchecked by any entity and that it's become too grand you're going to have two very specific groups that form industrialists who support the bank they want a strong currency they want the federal government to be involved your opponents are going to be the agrarians who distrust the federal government the bank is going to be run by Nicholas Biddle, uh, more of a businessman than a politician. But Jackson is going to take on uh, this war against the National Bank. 
because he had been burned by the bank. Uh, he does not like soft money. Although he understands the value to Westerners of soft money, he prefers hard money based in silver and gold, held in silver and gold. So when the rechartering, the repassing of the bank comes up, Jackson is going to do what he does best. He vetoes it. And instead, he's going to put what's called pet banks in place in states instead who would approve uh, loans based on uh, what he wanted uh, from time to time. So the National Bank is going to expire in 1836 and out the window with it goes again uh, this uh, this federal regulation of the currency, of the money supply, of loans, of rates, uh, and that's going to lead us into a bad place in the economy. Uh, Clay, uh, who, who came from the corrupt bargain in the War of 1812, still not liking Jackson, who had faced off uh, throughout the presidency with Jackson. Uh, Jackson doesn't like Clay's uh, internal improvements plan at all. Uh, and Calhoun, who had written uh, and pushed for uh, the tariff to be, abol to be abolished, uh, really supported getting rid of the tariff, is going to have this rivalry uh, with Clay. Uh, Calhoun's wife is going to be very mean to the Secretary of War's wife. The, this pushes for states' rights uh, and the issues uh, of states' rights. Uh, Overall, Jackson is going to support the federal government versus supporting the state's rights, which is kind of surprising. Now, the last piece that we have to go over with uh, Jackson is his relations with the Native Americans. Now, as far as his history with the Native Americans, Jackson had won a victory, uh, had been victorious in the Creek War of 1814, winning lands in Georgia and Alabama from the Creeks and the Seminoles. Uh, he also beat the Seminoles in the Seminole War of 1818 and won lands in Florida. So he becomes known known as this champion against uh, Native Americans in his career in the war. Now the South, where many of his supporters were, um, it, it was starting to turn towards Native American land and see dollar signs in their eyes. But in the South, Native Americans that had remained had begun to adopt aspects of white American culture and became known as the five civilized tribes. And these are going to be the Cherokee, the Chickasaw, the Creek, the Choctaw, and the Seminole. And when I say civilized i mean they were practicing christianity they were establishing schools they owned private property they formed their own constitutional republican governments and they even had a writing system but jackson's political base in the south expected him to remove the 60,000 native americans of the five nations from the region so that the southerners could take that land for uh, agriculture that was very profitable land. The, Southerns are, the Southerners are going to insist that Native Americans could never be civilized no matter what they did, and the uh, state of Georgia is going to take on the Cherokee Nation. Uh, and the court case that you need to associate with this is Wooster. I know it doesn't look like that, but it's Wooster versus Georgia, and this is going to take place under the Supreme Court. Uh, the Native Americans in 1832 are going to appeal their case to keep their land that was trying to be taken away by the state of Georgia all the way up to the Supreme Court. The court is going to rule that the land seizure from Georgia of the Native American land was unconstitutional. And the reason being was because the federal government had treaty obligations to protect the natives and their land. Marshall, ever the Federalist, is going to uh, see that federal law is superior to the state laws here. 
Now, Jackson is going to look at uh, Marshall's decision and kind of make a mockery out of it. His response to the Supreme Court decision uh, is that John Marshall has made his decision, now let him enforce it, knowing all well that the executive branch is supposed to enforce and carry out decisions made by the judicial. Jackson is going to urge Congress to pass what becomes known as the Indian Removal Act, which on paper had said that they would peacefully negotiate the exchange of native land in areas like Florida, Georgia, Louisiana uh, for Indian territory, which is now in modern day Oklahoma. The Choctaws and the Chickasaws are going to leave their land. Few, very few are going to stay, and any of those that did stay were going to be facing uh, violent mistreatment. Uh, the Cherokees in 1835 uh, are going to face a whole uphill battle because a group of Native Americans who did not represent their tribe but claiming to do so had made a deal with the government and had said that the Cherokee would abandon their land and move to Oklahoma. And in 1838, U.S. soldiers are going to force the Cherokee from their land, 16,000 Cherokee from their lands uh, to, uh, it, to Oklahoma and this forcible movement of Native Americans becomes known as the Trail of Tears. Of that 16,000 uh, Cherokee that were moved, you have women, children, elderly walking, and we're going to look at a map here in a second, from uh, Georgia from uh, the their native lands that they had lived for centuries to this land out in the West that they had never known before, many of which dying from exposure and starvation and exhaustion along the way. Uh, in 1836, the Creeks are also going to be forcibly removed from their land. Between 1835 and 1842, some of the Seminoles in Florida are going to attempt to fight for their land in what becomes known as the Second Seminole War. Uh, but in the end, the Seminoles are forced to lead to leave. Uh, and, and what this really amounts to is the Native Americans facing the harshest of treatments that we have seen uh, from the United States uh, in this process of just greed, to greed to get more land. Uh, and when we look at the map here, you can see uh, where these Native Americans are where they're starting, which is in the purple you can see on the map, and where they're being forced to. Those red lines that you see, that is the Trail of Tears, the forcible movement of the Cherokee and Creek into the Indian Territory, which is now modern-day Oklahoma. The blue lines that you see are the other Native American routes uh, for removal. Uh, and notice and think about this, all of the Native Americans, these tribes, are being forced into the same territory. They're all being pushed into one place. And they all have differing backgrounds. They all have different, differing beliefs, different ways of life. And now they're being forced into a very small territory, a new place, and they're being forced to share this land. Whereas before, they, they were very spread out, able to uh, kind of be self-sufficient. And now they're being forced, and sometimes next to their enemies, because not all of these native nations uh, got along with each other. They're being forced to share this territory together. And this is going to be one of the worst mistreatments of Native Americans in our history. And it only leads to uh, more uh, absolutely brutal treatment. But this is where we take a pause from Unit 4. Uh, any questions, please let me know. Just a quick look back at your outline for this week. Don't forget, you have Journal 9 due, the evaluation of the Monroe Doctrine. Your short paper is also due this week, and your exam is going to be posted on Friday. Any troubles with anything, please let me know.